Okay, anything lingering from last week we need to get cleaned up? Well, all of my grading may not be caught up, all the signature assignments are graded. So, you can't complain at me about that. All right, last week we talked about various or sundry different types of disorders. So this week, of course, we'll follow that up with certain ways to intervene with those types of disorders. In other words, we're going to talk about how to do therapy or which types of therapy you can use depending on what circumstance you're dealing with. A couple of things to bear in mind as we start through the menagerie. First thing, of course, is that all therapies, all modalities have some level of successfulness about them, else they would not still be around. They have to be productive in some way or other, or nobody would bother to follow any of those particular guidelines. So from that standpoint, all types of therapy are good therapies. Now, that does not mean that all of those therapies are good for everybody. Some people don't do as well with something like free association, for an example, or, or perhaps even something along the lines of even contemporary cognitive behavioral therapy. It depends on the person, what makes that person go, and the challenges that person deals with. The other significant aspect of therapies is to remember that the trick, if there is such a thing, or that the greatest part of the technique is not the model of the therapy. The model of the therapy actually makes absolutely no difference. Therapy's benefits come in the relationship that's established between the therapist and the client. That is all about the ability to build rapport, to establish a meaningful relationship. Okay, can we focus on this class maybe? The relationship that's established between the client as well as the therapist. You got inpatients, you got outpatients. The majority of people I have ever dealt with, in fact, all of them with the exception of one, has been an outpatient. The one who was an inpatient at one time came to me after she left the hospital. Because to get out of Red River, you have to check in with your therapist as soon as they turn you loose. So I ended up, she ended up in my office. But aside from her, everybody I've ever dealt with has been an outpatient. In other words, none of them have been acutely suicidal. Now, I've dealt with a number of other clients who have been acutely suicidal that have had to have some significant conversation via the telephone or whatever else in the midst of their suicidality. Uh, but in general, most folks don't reach the level of needing to go to the hospital. And normally, individuals who do are dealing with something in which they feel it necessary to harm themselves to the point of killing themselves, or they have lost touch with reality to some significant degree. It's really kind of hard to function if you're not aware of who you are and where you are. It's just one of those funny things. You need to know a little bit more about yourself and where you happen to be if you're going to function with the rest of us. But always remember the relationship between the client and the therapist. That is what it is that moves the therapeutic process along, is how those folks manage to interact. So we're going to start with psychodynamic theory, which is the old grandpappy of, of therapies, if you want to look at it that way. It comes from psychoanalysis and our friend Sigmund Freud. What that model does is tries to help clients understand all the unconscious stuff that's going on in them that creates some of their maladaptive behavior. Go back to some of the early material we probably hit on in the semester from the standpoint of the unconscious or the subconscious, depending on which particular word you want to use for it. Um, the id, the superego, the ego, all those sorts of things. The majority of your world, from the psychodynamic perspective, is unconscious. You are not aware of it to any great degree at all, which can be a bit problematic. If, on the other hand, you can manage to understand how your unconscious is communicating with you, in a manner of speaking, it gives you a bigger opportunity to deal with some of the struggles you have. For example, um, from a psychodynamic perspective, we deal with all kinds of stuff. We're about being aggressive and about procreating, all those sorts of things. 
when we encounter something that creates angst or anxiety for us, our unconscious or our subconscious creates for us what's called the defense mechanism. And what that is, is that it creates for your conscious mind a way to behave so that whatever is giving you anxiety doesn't bother you as much. In other words, it's kind of like putting a Band-Aid on it, in a way. It can be very helpful, but a lot of times what we dis have discovered with those particular defense mechanisms is that they become very maladaptive, meaning they are not helpful. As the example, when people become passive aggressive, we'll use that as an example, uh, people get passive aggressive, they're anxious about something in their unconscious, so they're being aggressive without realizing they're being aggressive with a partner or a significant other or their friends or whatever, their children. And in the process of that, that behavior becomes unproductive. It doesn't help in any way. They're trying to cover up their anxiety with their own aggression, which is counterproductive. There are all kinds of defense mechanisms that come into play. We'll probably talk about a few of them. Psychoanalysis also deals with dreams and their interpretations to some degree or other. Um, the psychodynamic folks have certain imagery they use for dreams and the content of those dreams and what those things mean. Uh, you can get on the interweb and come up with all kinds of interesting things related to how people view symbols from dreams. At the bottom, at the bottom of it all is that, generally speaking, every person you dream about, good, bad, or indifferent, relates to some aspect of you and your personality. In other words, you are processing information related to yourself in some way or other. Now let that sit there with, for a minute. Yeah, it can be like, I'm doing what? You're encountering things in life that you haven't been able to process at a conscious level, so you deal with it unconsciously while you sleep. It's one of the ways the body manages to cope. Now, how does that account for off the wall dreams. I have stabbed people in my sleep. I have been shot. I have fallen. I have not ever hit the ground. Um, you know, you hear the old wise tale about if you fall in the dream and splat, you're probably going to die in your sleep. No, that's not going to happen that way. Um, but I've, I've been shot, been stabbed, fall, fall down, fight people, scream, holler, carry on. Last night I was talking to a lady um, who is actually a, a lady who used to work in special ed folks over in Nocona. Um, and I was trying to get to her in a classroom. She had a different name in the classroom, though, for, for whatever reason this time. And I was concerned about being able to do some testing for her. Now, in the grand scheme of things, that makes absolutely no sense to most people but me. It's my dream, and it makes perfectly good sense to me. The reason for that is that she has wanted me to do assessment work with CPS children forever. Checking all the boxes off to be able to do that is a pain in the butt. If you zig when you should zag on that application, they're going to kick that application back to you, and it becomes a whole lot more bureaucracy than it's worth for the money they pay. But having a dream such as this one at this particular time means that I probably need to seriously have a conversation with her about doing that. Does that mean my world's coming to an end? No. Am I wrong? Maybe. But even if I am, somebody might benefit out of that dream if I do an assessment of some kind or other with these kids. I got a phone call the day before. <laughs> no, that would have been, that was yesterday. It wasn't Sunday. Yesterday, I got a phone call from some lady in Atlanta wanting me to come do some assessments with, actually, it was going to be her grandson who was in a private uh, Catholic school. Somehow, she had gotten my number from a school out there. And I chuckled at her and said, I'm happy to, to come and assess for you, but please understand, I'm in Texas. And she just broke up just cracked up. She said, oh, I guess the school made a mistake. I guess so. I mean, I'm happy to come out there if that's what you want me to do, but I bet there are some folks in Atlanta who can do this for you a lot cheaper than I can. Oh, I, I appreciate you calling me back. So I've gotten two big things in the last couple of days that have to do with assessing children. That's not my bailiwick. Can I do that? Yes. Can I do it well, reasonably? Would I rather work with grown-ups? Yes, but will I work with children when it's necessary? Sure, but it's not my favorite. It's not my go-to by any means. So I probably need to have some conversation with some people about that. Something's perking around in my unconscious or whatever trying to get out. Okay, no harm, no foul. But you have to be willing to look or to listen to what your system is trying to tell you. 
Because again, the kind of stuff we dream, we get all weirded out about sometimes and we think, well, that's just, why would I do that? Especially if any of those dreams get a little on the kinky side, everybody wigs out then. It's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And, if, and I'm telling you that has to do with your personality. Y'all are going to twitch a little bit. That doesn't mean you're looking to be sexual with some other person necessarily. It just means you've got some unresolved stuff back there you probably ought to take a look at. Don't call me. I can't help you in that regard. It'd be a conflict. You know, but we dream and we process information, and psychodynamic theory relies an awful lot on that. You'll also find that a lot of people don't practice that particular model as much. It's, I'm not saying it's archaic, but I am saying it's rather old, and that the cognitive models tend to be a whole lot more productive because you can measure the result. When you're dealing with psychodynamic theory, you're dealing with things that you cannot measure. I'm dealing with a level of anxiety that I don't know I have. And they, one of the big things that they use in psychodynamic ther therapy is what's called free association. Sigmund Freud had people lay on his couch typically. His clients were women, which has its own interesting little piece. Um, but he visited with these people every day, usually at least five times a week, if not seven. Every day he would deal with these folks. He would sit in a chair just out of their view and they would speak whatever came to mind to them. My dog has fleas. And he would do nothing. He, it's called, and you associate, well, what does that mean? What does that tell you about? You know, and you kind of prompt the conversation along a little bit, and they'll eventually get to something in theory that you can work with. I'm not worried about your dog having fleas. How does that help us? I don't like my mother. That we can talk about. Now, does it take a while to establish a rapport significant enough for people to let themselves think out loud? Yes, it does. It can be very, very long-term therapy, which the majority of folks don't want to fool with. Who wants to spend years doing therapeutic work? Not only is it a long time, it's an awful lot of money. And people don't want to spend that type of cash necessarily. But you can do psychoanalysis or psychodynamic theories related to how we manage money, how we manage our relationships. You can talk about verbal skills, all kinds of different things. But some of those things will limit the ability for folks to get a little better. You can talk about the ego, all kinds of fun stuff and how that stuff works. But if, there's, if you don't equip somebody with tools they can use to help themselves behave in a way that's more helpful for them, you're not doing them a whole lot of good. And ethically, if you're not getting better when I'm dealing with you after a certain amount of time, it's more ethically appropriate for me to refer you to someone else versus continue to visit with you and take your money and you not get better. It's much more appropriate. In fact, if I was to do that, I'm going to get in trouble at some point. So the idea is to push people on or to get people better and still move along. You'll find that most folks who do more cognitive driven models try to get things done in less than six months, sometimes as few as 12 sessions. The idea is that after six months, after about 26 meetings, the longer you go, the less effective it becomes. In other words, it's best to get your business done and move along if it can be done that way. So again, that comes into play with psychodynamic theory because people go for a much longer periods of time. Object relations is a piece that comes out from underneath psychodynamic ther therapies. And that's when folks uh, approach beliefs that personality is coming from some of those other conflicts and how we need to get some more support in our other relationships. In other words, we have difficulty with the object, which may be a person maybe a circumstance, could be your work, or whatever else. Um, there's, a, there's a handful of other variations, but they're typically much more time limited. But psychodynamic therapy is how the whole schmear began. And sometimes people take a look at Freud and go, that really doesn't make any sense to us in the year 2019. But I would suggest this, while we may not look at the largest part of his work anymore because a lot of it has been debunked. There is some credibility to some things like this. All of you, all of us, are anxious about any number of things. 
I could make reference at the moment to saying something along the line about asking a question and sitting here quietly and waiting for someone to answer. Y'all are going to get anxious. It won't take but just a second, and y'all will start twitching, waiting for someone to speak so that you don't have to. We're all anxious about something, whether it's about our school grades, whether it's about our relationships, whether it's about we perform well enough for other people to think we're important, whether or not we're liked, whatever. You could, you're, some of y'all are anxious about what you're going to have for lunch. I mean, and we get anxious about all kinds of different things. But anxiety is what drives psychodynamic therapy. We are anxious about things, but we're not aware that we're anxious, which is what creates the maladaptive behavior. Does that make sense? In other words, we're behaving without paying attention to what we're doing. Now, when you can bring those challenges into the conscious mind, it gives you an opportunity to manage them a little more appropriately. It can be done. But it can be awful difficult for folks to look at some therapist and say, you know what, I am really, really pissed off. Regardless of what you're pissed off about. I was 40 years old before I told anybody I was angry. And I had been angry for years. And it created all kinds of strange <clears throat> behaviors that I exhibited in all kinds of environments. It didn't matter. Once I told somebody that I was angry, life got a whole lot easier. This pisses me off. That doesn't mean I have to do something about it, but being able to acknowledge what I was thinking about was very helpful. You might give it some consideration sometime. The human, but the, the psychodynamic therapies are fun if you're into dealing with anxiety, and a lot of therapists are not. I am. Um, I, I depend a lot on dealing with the notion of angst and what it is that creates that angst. But I'm also not a psychodynamic therapist at all. Uh, they classify me in a different category. We'll get to that maybe. What about the humanistic approach? That's the big approach that occurred after the fact with psycho psychodynamic therapy. It's a little more contemporary. It is very person-centered, meaning it's all about you and what you do and how you behave, what you think, how you respond to other people's behaviors, all that kind of stuff. It is very what we call client-centered. The guy who put that theory together is a fellow by the name of Carl Rogers. He called it client-centered or person-centered therapy. It's about the relationship between the therapist and the client. It has three big pieces, unconditional positive regard, empathy, and congruence. And I'll unpack those a little bit anyway. Unconditional positive regard. That means that I'm going to show you significant, um, I'm going to behave with you in such a way that you realize you have value and worth as a person. That, that I genuinely care about you. Whether I do or not is really not important. If I do my job well, you will think I do. And as a part of that process, you can trust me and tell me what's on your mind and that you really do have the ability to change if that's what you decide you want to do. If what happens as a part of the demonstration of unconditional positive regard is you walk into my office and you tell me I want to kill my children. In all fairness, my first response would be who doesn't at some point in time which then is going to help you chuckle a little bit and kind of relax, but we're going to explore a little bit what about it about those kids makes you want to kill them. And I'm, not, I'm going to help you explore that without saying, oh, you suck as a parent. I'm going to say, tell me some more. Tell me some more about that. How does that work for you or whatever else that keeps that conversation moving so that you're honored for the thought you're having I'm not going to judge the fact that you want to kill your children. I've wanted to kill mine. I think that's probably a normal human response. You'd have to ask other folks who have children. At some point, you want to kill them all. And probably other people's children, too. You're normal. But it can create some maladaptive behaviors if you don't deal with that. Because you just can't go up to your neighbor and kill the neighbor's children. That's going to be problematic. And you don't want them coming to deal with your children, either. 
but you can have conversation about those challenges in a way that honors that person's feelings and those concerns. The biggest reason I don't practice as much of that as I probably should, I'm a little more confrontational in my therapeutic approaches. I ask people straight out, how's that behavior helping you? And when you tell me it's not, I'm going to smile and say, then let's get another one. Why should I wait for you to decide, oh, this is really not helpful. Maybe let's do it some more, and then we'll think about changing it later. No, we're going to change it now. Why would I want to wait? And on top of all that, why would you want to wait? You know, the humanistic approaches are much less confrontational. They're going to let you go for a while. I don't. If nothing else, I don't think it's fair for me or for you as a, as a client. But again, that's my own hang-up. Empathy. Can I empathize with someone? Can I appreciate how the world looks from your perspective? Sure I can. Tell me what it's like to be you. How does that work? What's it like? A great example here, and I've done this more than once, and I've done it with people that I trust. I was the person asking the question. We weren't doing therapy. One of those folks, one of my friends, um, a, a dear friend, um, who teaches at a theological school who is out loud and proud. He is very gay, has known he is very gay for the largest proportion of his life, and he's the kind of person who's out loud and important. He'll get a bullhorn and go to Washington, D.C. and blow on that sucker. He does not play. He is very confrontational when it comes to his sexual expression, and he is not afraid. He is extremely comfortable in his own skin. Okay, if I had a client come into my office who was having some kind of issue with that, that was being problematic in some way, my first question, what's it like to be you? Tell me about that. Because I'm genuinely curious. I did that with my friend. Dude, what's it like being you? Now, the problem with that type of question is that you might get an answer. You might find out more about your friend than you wanted to know. At that particular moment, he could have stopped a couple of comments before he got finished. But he was willing to be vulnerable and tell me about what his life is like. I did it with an a instructor when I was working on my Ph.D., a lesbian woman, of course, from San Francisco, California, who had carried a child for her and for her mate. They had gotten the sperm at the sperm bank. They got married in California immediately after it became legal. If you remember that particular time, it also became illegal again, and then it was legalized a second time. They got married the first time and were so afraid that someone was going to get into their home and steal their marriage documents that they had them hidden away. And I asked her, can I visit with you after lunch one day? And she said, what for? She was teaching my multicultural class. She's African-American. Her partner was from El Salvador or is from El Salvador. She said, what do you want to know? Well, I don't know what it's like to be you. If that's a reasonably safe question, if you're not too uncomfortable talking to me about it, no, I'll talk to you. So she did. And she told me just what I told you. She didn't know me from Adam. I was in her class, but that's all she knew about me. But she was willing to tell me a little bit about what it was like to be her. Having empathy is being willing to learn about somebody else and to realize that even if I'm different, that's okay and that it doesn't matter in that regard, and that I'm willing for you to be who you are in the therapy session. It is a wonderful tool. Sometimes we exercise the notion of empathy, which is somewhat similar to compassion, when we deal with significant others in our world, our children, in those days when we don't want to kill them, or with our parents as they age and don't remember things quite as well or whatever else. We all have the ability to be empathic. It's about whether or not we will or not. A third aspect of client-centered therapy is congruence. The way the therapist feels is consistent with how the therapist is going to act. In other words, if I'm telling you one thing, I'm talking to you very openly, but I'm sitting back in my chair like this all closed up, that's not congruent. You may not realize it, but you'll pick up on the fact that I'm closed off from you. You'll never see me in my office, ever, sitting like this. Never, never, never. 
I will cross my legs periodically and I shift from one butt cheek to the other. But that's all. My, I'm either writing or my hands are resting on the arms of my chair. I'm very comfortable doing that. I've done it long enough that I don't think that much about it anymore. But what you're going to get from me is verbiage, and I'm going to give you body language that matches, that's very open and willing to hear what it is you've got to say. You'd be surprised. You really would be surprised at how simple therapy can be most of the time. You know what people really need? Something really simple. Permission. They need permission to be who they are. Whatever that happens to be. That's all. Sounds simple enough. But think about for your own self for just a minute. The places in your world where you need permission to be fully the person you know yourself to be. Not the person that you're showing me in the classroom. But the person you know yourself to be underneath all of those other layers. If you were to ever come into my office, which you're not. But if you ever did come into my office, you would get the impression that those, that person is okay. And it's okay for me to talk to that person. It's not a different personality. You're not psychotic or anything like that. But it is a wonderful thing to give people permission to be who they are. I was angry. My therapist said, it's all right to be pissed off. Really? I haven't been pissed off before. Try being angry for 40 years. It is not helpful. Then I had to figure out what I was going to do with that agitation when it started leaking out. Was it appropriate for me to pitch it all over my family? No. Did I have to figure out how to manage it in a way? I did. And I had a therapist who was a little more psychodynamically inclined who was able to help me do that. It was a great thing. But the humanistic approaches, again, they have some variations. Another one's called Gestalt therapy. What they do... The, the Gestalt folks help people become more self-aware and self-accepting. They have a, a particular um, tool of intervention. It's called an empty chair. And what they do, again, Gestalt therapy is a, a little bit of the object relations things going on. In it, so it's about, it has to do a lot of times with people and the conflicts we have with folks. Put an empty chair in your office and you put the, the client puts the person with whom they have conflict I'm upset with my dad so I put my dad imaginarily in the chair and then the therapist is going to empower that client to speak whatever you need to speak to your dad yeah we're role playing in the therapy room and that person gets enough empowerment to speak what they want to speak whether they do it in real life doesn't make any difference. The fact that they can do it in a therapy room is often just enough to get them over the hump of being agitated or whatever they are. Giving them permission. Again, all modes of therapy can be helpful to some degree or other. The biggest challenge is which one works for the client you're dealing with. And having enough skill to know what it is you do well versus what you don't. I know what I do well versus things I don't. I deal with anxiety, whether we call it that or not. It's got an existential feel to it. That's a philosophical approach that has to do with angst because we're generally fearful about any number of things and it manifests itself in inappropriate behavior, which all of us do it all the time. Just a matter of how much. Everybody still good? I can talk about therapies, by the way without too much trouble. They can be great fun. Um, it's kind of like disorders. You can come up with all kinds of folks I've visited with that can create all kinds of challenges. What's really fun is when someone knows they have an issue and knows, think they know more about the issue than you do, which is possible. If you ever want to talk to someone who demonstrates borderline personality disorder, they know very well what's wrong with them. They're prone to self-harm. They have extremely vacillating relationships. They're very unstable. They don't think real well and happen to open their mouths and let things fall out without thinking, which can get them into trouble. And a couple of other interesting behaviors that are just, if you know what you're looking for, they're very obvious, extremely obvious. 
Now, the challenge is to let that person be who he or she is. More times than not, by the way, it's you ladies. I've forgotten the percentage points, but you'll find far more women who demonstrate those behaviors than men. And the way that you can tell the difference a lot of times between them is which ones will self-harm. When you come across a male who self-harms like cuts, for example, he's probably got a little bit of borderline action going. But I can count on one hand how many times I've dealt with a man who has cut. I can't count how many women I've visited with who have cut. I'd probably say add a eight out of 10 across the years. It's because they get anxious and their response is to give themselves a little bit of pain so they can feel because they get concerned that they don't feel other things, if that makes any sense. It's fun stuff. Behavioral therapies, those are the ones in vogue these days. The ones you hear about the most and you're dealing strictly with behaviors. Those behaviors you have learned over time and whether or not you learn them in an adaptive way or a maladaptive way really doesn't matter because you do them regardless. You behave a certain way in certain circumstances all the time. It's kind of like training y'all to get ready to go right before 1030. Nothing to it. It's, it can be very adaptive unless I get in the mood and decide to keep you for a while. Then you're going to feel weird. You get anxious because I haven't dismissed you on time. And again, we probably wouldn't think about it like that, but you do. You get a little twitchy, a little anxious because you're accustomed to behaving in a specific way. How many of you have dealt with animals at home that you've trained to give you a certain behavior to get a certain, you give them something to behave in a certain way? Sure you do. You do it with your kids. You think about it for a second. All behavior is programmed. All of it. You've learned it from somewhere else. And you demonstrate the behaviors you demonstrate because they get you what you want. It's when you don't get what you want that the behavior becomes problematic. And you get anxious because you don't know why it doesn't work this time. Then you have to figure out what's going on with that. Then you get angry. And here you are in this wonderful little thought circle that you can't get out of. Again, assuming that makes some sort of sense. Behaviors can be very maladaptive. Talk to the person who's an addict. The person gets upset about something he or she wants to use. That's not, a, that's not an adaptive behavior that's helpful that I know of. So they go do what they're accustomed to doing. And it becomes a trained response, programmed to respond in a specific way. The behavioral therapies deal with modifying your behavior, changing it. If it's not working for you, why continue to do it? The definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result every time. You're going to get the same result every time. It doesn't work that time. It's not going to work again. How many times when you get on your computer and it gives you an error message, do you boot it? It gives you the error message again, you boot it. It gives you the error message again, and you boot it still a third time. How many times will you boot it? Till it quits giving you an, it's not going to give you any other message but the error one till you fix the error. You think about it for a second. Why would behavior be any different? You do the same thing over again, thinking it's going to be different every time. It won't be. It's going to be exactly the same, and you'll get yourself into a bind. You'll get discouraged about things, and it becomes very problematic. Change the behavior. You know that rats, or pigeons specifically, in that experiment, but rats will do it too. You can put a, rats or pigeons in a cage and train them to peck a lever or to push a lever that gives them a little shot of dopamine. In other words, you wire up their brains to this little lever and they stimulate the parts of the bird or the rat brain that make it feel like it's getting a nice little jolt of cocaine. And once you train them to do that, they will continue to do that and continue to do that and continue to do that. They won't eat. They won't mate. They'll do nothing except push that lever till they die. Because it feels good. 
regardless of what you do, they get themselves programmed into a specific behavior and they do it over and over and over to the point they die because they haven't eaten or they fry their brains, one or the other. And again, it's about changing people's behavior. And the way to do that is to help them desensitize. If you're looking for a behavior modification when you're dealing with things that make you anxious or nervous, how many of you don't do snakes? I'm sure that yeah, a bunch of y'all are not going to be worried about no snake. It's like snake comes on the property, I'm out. My wife can't even look at a snake on the TV without wigging out. I mean, she'll just sit there and do this. It's like, girl, get a hold of yourself. It doesn't matter if they're poisonous or not. If it, if it slithers on the ground, she's out. Now, she would never be able to do this. I mentioned it to her one time, and she told me that I was crazy, just bat poop crazy. The way to get over that is a desensitization process, which involves something as crazy as having a snake in a room, far, far away from you, by the way, like a room like this big. And our room over here is twice as big as y'all's over yonder. Got a snake in a cage in the back. This cage, it can't get out. The first aspect of your therapy might be able to get to the door and peek in the window without freaking out. That might have been your first accomplished goal for dealing with snakes. And you move the person over time into the room. You open the door and you let them stand outside, that sort of thing, whatever. And over time, you desensitize them to the presence of the snake. And what really happens in real time, people do it all the time. They'll eventually get to where they can hold the snake. But here's the catch. Here you go. In this room over here, folks, a couple of folks are shake, shaking their head like, oh, hell no. Right? And it wouldn't work for you because you're not concerned about wanting to pick up the snake. If you wanted to pick up the snake, it would be a helpful therapy for you. My wife doesn't want to pick up a snake. And the folks over here are shaking their head like, oh, heck no, I'm not going to do it. No, it won't help you. But the only way to deal with some of those fears, and please understand, being afraid of snakes is not irrational. It's a very rational thing. It, that's hardwired. Nobody is born being interested in playing with snakes. We don't work that way. But if you don't have an, an interest in modifying the behavior, you're not going to be able to change it, which is an important piece. That's why addicts have so much trouble. They don't have any issue being an addict until they get themselves into trouble, then they're concerned about being able to change it. But only then, and that's because it's created. People will not change their behavior until they are under enough stress or hurt enough that changing is better than dealing with whatever heaviness they're carrying around. And the only way to do that is to modify a person's behavior. The other aspect of behavioral therapies is what's called modeling I behave for you in a way that's appropriate. Tell you about other people I know who behave in a way that's appropriate for your particular issue. Giving them some empowerment. It really is okay to tell your significant other, other no. And you don't have to do anything but that if that's what you need permission to do. There are some things that come after that when that significant other wigs out because you said no, that's a different problem. I can't tell him or her no. Go back to the, one, the example of clean clothes, and I'll pick on the dudes for a minute. Ladies, you've got some dude that comes in your house and starts taking off his work clothes at the front door and makes a trail through the house. Leave them some bucks for like where they are. You leave them there. Now, you're going to trip out. Your OCD people are going to wig out because you've got clothes strung out across your house. He'll come looking for his clothes when all of his drawers are dirty, right? He'll come look for some clean. He'll want to know why did where are my clothes? They're right where you left them. Clothes get washed when they begin in the laundry room. Train him. I, don't go wash them. He doesn't like it. Let him wash them. He'll figure it out. Do that with your children when they start fighting you over what they're going to have for dinner. Dinner's between 6 and 6.30, whatever time it is for you. The kitchen is closed at 6.30. No, you don't go make a sandwich. This is what's for dinner between 6 and 6.30. Kitchen closes at 6.30. Well, what am I going to eat? I don't have the foggiest idea. 
was breakfast doesn't open until whatever time. You'll be all right. Kid will figure out how to eat real fast. That's what you do to your pets, isn't it? You put food on the floor and they don't eat it, you pick it up. Do the same thing with your kids. No, I'm not being abusive. It's called behavioral training. I'm not telling you to starve your kids, so don't go walking down the hall saying, Dr. Hamilton says we ought to starve our kids, take the food away. I didn't say any such a thing. But you can teach them by helping them modify behavior. You can model how you want them to behave. It's what happens in group therapies all the time. People learn how to speak with one another and say things that they're not accustomed to saying in an appropriate way. I can tell you, you know, I told you about the lady or the, the TV commercial when the, when the lady walks in and asks her, he's sitting at the counter in the kitchen reading the paper, and she walks in in a dress, and she says, Honey, does this dress make me look fat? And his response, are you ready? You betcha. Because he is not listening. Now, he could speak with her about whether or not that dress was attractive. Could she find another dress that was more attractive? He could have a conversation with her about that in a very gentle way without saying, No, honey, your butt's as broad as that barn over there or whatever. No. Yeah, that dress makes you look like a hippo. That's not going to be helpful. And you ladies who had that type of conversation know exactly what I mean. You can teach folk how to respond in an appropriate way. There are other things you have that are more flattering. And just not speak to what they actually spoke to begin to start. You can answer the question without saying you're stupid. You could come up with a better answer. Got nothing to do with whether you're stupid or not. And again, it's about how you communicate the information you're trying to communicate. Does it matter what the other person does with it? Sure, but that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to speak the stuff that's important to you. And then to learn how to listen for the other person. And when you don't know what they really mean, you ask. What I heard you say was that I was ugly and my mama dresses me funny. Well, that may be true. If that's true, I can't help you. Is that what you said? No, honey, I said that you could find some other clothes that are a little more flattering. Those are very different things. I cannot control what the other person hears, but I can get clarification on what they hear. I didn't say that. Or if I did, I misspoke, and this is what I actually meant. At my house, when my wife says, what I heard you say was, I stop whatever I'm doing right now because she is entering a significant conversation for her. She is backtracking and picking up pieces of information that evidently I've given her that have not added up the way they're supposed to. If I'm holding the remote to the TV, I put the remote down, push mute, and I look at her to make sure that I understand exactly what she's saying. We learned how to do that because we've done our own therapy work. It wasn't hard. What I heard you say was that you didn't want to go mow the grass. Is that so? Is that what is that what you said? Well, yeah, that's what I said. Okay. And you move along. No, I didn't say I was going to burn the house down. I said I didn't want to mow the grass or whatever. Lots of things like that related to the therapeutic technique that you're using. You can model good behavior. We do it in group. People learn how to speak things without being ugly. And again, it's about giving folks permission. You give them positive reinforcement. You want to teach a child not to do something? Ignore him. Ignore the behavior you don't want to see. Give him good stroke for the behavior that you do want to see. Little Johnny goes and picks up his room. When you tell him, give him all kinds of good. Thank you, little Johnny, for picking up your room. I appreciate that so much. You know what? He's going to be a little more inclined to go clean it up the second time, so you'll tell him good job again. That's why, my, that's why my therapy stuff is a little more confrontational because I'm not always in favor of saying, good job. I'm not a good job kind of guy. And when I get a client who really needs a good job, we're going to have a problem. And I'll tell them straight out, you probably ought to visit with someone else if you're going to be dependent on me giving you wonderful stroke because you're breathing today. I'm not going to do that. 
You breathe because that's what you have to do to live. You go to work because that's what's necessary to buy groceries. It's not bless your heart that you have to go to work or whatever. My husband doesn't like me. Well, maybe you're not likable. What do you want me to do? And again, I get a little confrontational. There's actually a style for that. It's a particular therapeutic type of intervention. It's remotive. Um, it's called emotive cognitive therapy. And, and the idea is to be confrontational because it jerks people out of their original thinking pattern. It's done that way on purpose. See, when I said something like that a while ago, y'all stopped what you were doing and looked up. Something different. Oh, Dr. Hamilton said that lady was fat or whatever. And you stopped exactly what you were doing, look up at me with a big grin on your face because you know exactly what I mean. And there are ways to learn how to do that stuff and you can learn therapeutically. There are ways to modify that behavior, again, with the desensitization or with extinction. It's a different process when you alter behaviors by removing reinforcers. And again, part of that kind of stuff is, again, challenging because it depends on what type of stimul stimulus that you use to deal with your behavior. You ever heard of a product called Antibuse? It is a drug that people who have alcohol problems use periodically. If you take antibuse and then drink alcohol, you will throw that alcohol right back up. It's called an aversive therapeutic technique. What ends up happening is that you associate barfing with the fact that you just drank that booze because that other chemical makes you toss it up. And you just make a good association with the fact that the alcohol is not helpful for you. The only way to get around that is to not drink the alcohol or stop taking the antibiotics. One or the other. You choose. It's that simple. But it'll teach you not to drink. It's the same sort of principle when a child touches something hot. They will only touch something hot twice. If they don't get it the first time, they'll get it the second time. You think about it for a second. You do, you do therapy work in a similar fashion. You can give them, it's a great, uh, what do they call it, just a second. Um, oh, I'll think of the actual term for it in a minute. I, I've had couples come to my office, and they fight all the time. I mean, it doesn't matter what they're fighting about. That doesn't, what it is doesn't make any difference. But you create an abnormal intervention for them. When you fight, you have to fight for four hours. And you cannot stop until the four hours is up. And the first time they try to fight for four hours, they'll get the hang of it and decide that they could probably come up with something better to do with their time. If they don't get it the first time, guess what? I'll bet they get it the second. Think about it for a minute. You do something over and over again that's not helpful, you'll change your mind. It just takes a minute. And sometimes you just have to give somebody else a chance to tell you an option to, to exercise that might be more helpful. You want to punish somebody? Knock yourself out, but be careful. This is important. When it comes to punishment, the punishment will be based on what type of response you use for that behavior. You can overpunish. You can create circumstances when your children become abnormally aggressive because of excessive punishment. Please don't mishear me. I'm not telling you to spank your kids or not to spank your kids. That's your business. But I am telling you one thing. If you do, it needs to be consistent all the time. Punishment must be the same for whatever infraction all the time. If little Johnny smacks his little sister, you can't say, that's not nice, and the next time smack his face. That will not be helpful. You'd be far better off smacking his face the first time if that's what you're going to do. But be consistent. If my mother ever said she was going to smack my mouth, she meant that. And I knew she did because she would smack that son of One time, as crazy as this was, I had a mouthful of railroad tracks, all kinds of braces way back in the day when there was a lot of metal in there. I was being abnormally sassy, which didn't take much. She said, if you don't stop, I'm going to thump your lip and watch you bleed. 
She did. But this is one thing she hadn't counted on. I kept on, and she did smack me. She sure did. And my lip did bleed. I sat on the couch across the room from her and let it dribble out of my mouth so she could watch. She never hit my mouth again. I wasn't quite as sassy about it either, but she never hit my mouth again. There's a way to modify. Now, I'm not saying I did that on purpose. Yeah, I did that on purpose, but I wasn't consciously trying to change her behavior. I was just being mean. That's the way we rolled way back in the day. But it worked. She never hit my mouth again. And yeah, I had a beat up lip on the inside. Sure did. Was it worth it? You betcha. Sure was. Worth every bit. And if she's sitting here in this room, I, if we've talked about it across the years before. So I'm not telling you anything that she would have said that much about. We talked about it. Everybody's behavior changed that day. Everybody's behavior. Sent from one little action. I'll watch you bleed. Yes, you are going to watch me bleed. You sure are. And again, I'm not telling you I always chose well. I'm not telling you that was the best decision. It worked okay that day, but it hurt me, literally. And it didn't do a whole lot to move our relationship along either. Not a bit. You have to choose wisely. But punishment always must be consistent. <laughs> she was consistent about smacking my mouth. She wasn't afraid. You have to follow through. I'm going to end with this. When it comes to punishment, never, hear me carefully, never tell your child you're going to do something you are not going to do. You tell little Johnny you're going to spank his butt, you better have whatever you're going to use ready to go. Because if you don't, you're a liar. You are inconsistent and you are not trustworthy. You cannot or have not done what you said you will do. That is very strong language. And I am not afraid to use it in that context. Do what you say you will do. It will be the best parenting tool you ever use. They need to know that you mean what you say, which means that you should say what you mean and to mean it all the time. Think about some of the challenges you've seen other people's children, not yours, other people's children get into. If you think about it for a second, I bet you discover that part of the reason they don't always behave well is because they get different behaviors from their caregivers depending on who's caregiving and the circumstance. Think about it for a minute. There's probably good research data out there that helps us understand how much bad behavior is because of bad parenting. Nobody parents 100% wonderfully all the time. But I've seen an awful lot of kids whose greatest problem was their parents. Their parents' inability to be consistent, to not give them good boundaries, all that kind of fun stuff. So we'll talk some more about some therapeutic interventions on Thursday. If y'all get curious about those sorts of things, come and ask me something. No worries. Live long. Prosper. Have fun. Enjoy the sunshine. Thank <laughs> you.